What's up, everybody? My name is Dan Kelly from Cockroach Labs. Welcome to Developer Tool Time. Um, we're very lucky today. We're being joined by the project founder of Liquidbase, Nathan Boxland. Nathan, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself in a second here. But first, I'd like to introduce you to my colleague, Andrew Werner. Andrew, why don't you say a little bit about what you do here at Cockroach Labs? Hi, I'm Andrew. I work on the SQL schema team here. So we manage of maintaining and distributing the schema of Cockroach within the nodes for planning and execution, as well as orchestrating all of the schema changes. So that's kind of where I spend my time in. Very cool. Where are you calling in from, Andrew? I'm calling in from New York, from Brooklyn. Uh, yeah, it's a nice. lovely fall, a little bit overcast, but it stopped raining. So it's that's nice good. to be here in New York in September. Getting a little crispy. Uh, Nathan, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself as well? Sure. Uh, yes, my name is uh, Nathan Boxland. I started the Liquibase open source project getting to be a lot of years ago now. Uh, but um, yeah, still um, now at Liquibase, the company, um, where we, we work to um, you know, kind of improve and, and expand Liquibase in general. Um, I particularly will um, kind of do a, a kind of primarily focus on kind of development, um, technical sort of things still in there. Uh, but also just kind of help out everywhere I can kind of across the company to help make it uh, the best it can be. That's great. So I want to ask a lot, you know, we're going to dive deep into Liquibase uh, on this demonstration. Or we'll get into a live demo here shortly, but I did want to ask some more general questions quickly before we get into uh, the demo. I'm, I am hearing a little accent. I know you're from Minnesota. <laughs> your, yep. your high school mascot was a potato. Can you it explain was. this? It's it's the spuds, those spuds. Uh, yeah, it's I don't know. It's it's a maybe a unique mascot across the country. I don't know. I, I think it came from you know our our high school was kind of built where there used to be a, a potato field. So I think that's where it came from. But you know, got the uh, person that dresses up as a you know potato, has a little cape and and everything. Um, my and then and then my uh, college that I went to in in town here as well. Their their mascot are the cobbers, uh, so it's like corn is their mascot. So apparently, I had a vegetable themed uh, mascots uh, growing up. God, that's so good. You guys are so wholesome. Um, <laughs> you just spuds and you just get all fired up, like just yeah. potatoes. That's, go, you yep. go crazy. That's right. Um, and I was I was doing some good natured digging on you before the, the stream. And I saw that you had a, a blog about where kids can eat for free. For you. <laughs> That's right. Yep. Yeah. Um, I found, found some good digging there. So, yeah, so that was a, um, you know, I, I, I definitely like to make, make things, you know, as a developer, I like to, you know, it's, it's, it's fun and cool to be able to just sort of have an idea and be able to make it, you know, that's, that's where liquid base originally came from. And one of the other things I kind of played with over the years was, um, yeah, a, where do kids eat free today app? You know, I, we recently had kids and, you know, I'm cheap. And so, you know, like to find, <laughs> you know, where we can go and eat and they're free. And it was hard to keep track of. And I thought, you know, I could make an app for this. Um, you know, it was, it was real old school where, you know, I think when I was working on it, it was, I think, pre app store on the, uh, on, on iOS, but I still kind of made the mobile focused app and kind of got there, you know, like it was in the days where you could make a, a iOS optimized app and they'll feature that. So it did actually even get featured on the Apple site at one point. Um, it was, you know, in real early Google cloud, it was going with, so got to play with some, you know, cool technology and got to, uh, um, got to save some money. So that's good. That's great. That reminds me, I had a terrible idea for an app when I lived in New York, I wanted to do a $1 pizza app. Uh, Andrew, are you familiar with this? You see all the $1 pizza places all over New York. Yeah, they're all over the place. They're great. I love those places. I wanted them. I wanted to know like where's the closest one to me at all times because yep. I was frequenting often. Yeah, uh, that's a lot. Very lot cool. Cool. But uh, yeah, kid, kids free focused. Yeah, love that. I've got a two year old. I wish I had that that app here in <laughs> Seattle. That'd be great. Um, where where did the idea for Liquibase come from? When when did that sort of start to take flight in your head? Yeah, sure. Um, so it was it probably actually we, we just had a 15 year celebration for my first blog post about it. Um, but I, I, at the time I was working for a company that um, uh, we did kind of, you know, sort of uh, technology consulting work. So it was again 15 years ago was 
long ago in the internet times, so we'd be helping, you know, a variety of companies be able to get, you know, their websites up and going and, you know, making shopping carts for everybody and, um, and uh, you know, content management systems and, and all, all sorts of stuff for a variety of companies. Um, and, you know, really had the problem that, um, uh, that you know, I, I'm working on the, the code, but I need to make sure the database matches the code. Um, otherwise, the whole thing's not going to work. And so was, was needing a way to kind of keep those two things in sync. Um, you know, as we we're use, using Java at the time, uh, there was some, uh, you know, I, I saw similar tools in other technology stacks like Ruby on Rails, especially at the time, had their Rails migration uh, was kind of in there. Uh, but there really wasn't kind of anything in Java to use. And uh, so figured, you know, why not make something uh, and and open source it from the beginning just because, you know, I've always been a big proponent of open source. The company I was at, I was a big proponent of open source at the time. So uh, I gave, you know, a good opportunity for me to see what is see what it was like to run a, uh, you kind of run an open source project from the other side. Um, but it, it was very much kind of scratching my itch. You know, I needed, I needed something that I could kind of bundle with the application. I needed something that needs to work across a variety of different database types. I needed something that needs, you know, that, that would work with my Java stack that I had. I needed something that, um, uh, you know, that I, I could kind of componentize and kind of pick pieces out that we needed for the different customers. Um, and uh, um, that's, yeah, really kind of where, where it started from. And a lot of those initial needs that I had uh, still kind of drive a lot of the major functionality in LocalBase today. Yeah, you segued nicely into my next question, which was, you know, 15 years is a long time. How has liquid base evolved? Are you surprised at all by the directions that it's gone in? Um, yeah, yes, always, always very surprised. Um, that's been kind of one of my um, sort of you know, biggest, biggest surprises and, and most interesting things I found with with kind of running the open source project is you know you, you start out with something, you, you start out with some ideas, you have kind of some ideas of what you know would be good functionality to have, but as you release it out into the world people come up with all sorts of, you know, crazy and interesting and amazing ways to, to try to use this tool that you made. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of that, a lot of those ideas have um, kind of turned into uh, some, some great features that we have. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's always surprising and cool to see how, how people are using LiquiBase and kind of where it's, it goes to. Um, you know, I certainly wasn't expecting to be, you know, doing this, you know, full time at a company that, you know, is looking to, you know, kind of, you know, bring it, um, you know, sort of commercialize it and, and uh, um, do all of that with it. That was, you know, far, it's, 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 it's made it far beyond my initial expectations. Yeah, that's that. So that must be like such an exciting feeling to have this little idea from 15 years ago become this huge thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I buried the lead a little bit, but I should have asked at the top for people who, who aren't familiar, what, what is liquid base? Um, so, so what local base is, is it's it really at its core, it's a, it's a tool to make sure that your, um, database matches your application code. It's a, it's a schema migration tool or kind of whatever you want to call it. It lets you define kind of the series of steps that it takes to get your database from, you know, empty database to the state that your application requires it to be at, in. Um, and then local base makes sure that, you know, for any given database, it gets it to that state that you need. Beautiful. Um, let's uh, let's transition into a live demo. Let, let's take a look at the goods. All right, I can do that. Uh, let me share my screen over here. Got to move everything around. No worries. And share the correct screen. <laughs> All right. So you see, uh, code editor here. All right. Um, so. Um, yeah, like I like I mentioned, the the, the big goal of, of LiquiBase is to be able to kind of define the the migration scripts that kind of get to where you where you need to be, um, and so just kind of pre setup. You know, all I've done is I installed LiquiBase locally. Uh, there's there's a variety of ways to to install LiquiBase. You know, the goal is to make it make it easy for everybody to to get and install. We have you know Windows and a Mac installer. We also have a tar and a um, zip file that you can just unzip to to where you want to be. Um, you know, kind of always looking at, at ways to make that that installation a little bit easier. Um, you know, in this case, I just in, I just installed it here into you know a subdirectory of my project. Normally, you're going to want to install it into some more kind of global place. 
Um, the other, the only other thing that I did as well in, in this installation is I added the Postgres driver um, into my uh, lib directory um, so that uh, Liquibase has that driver um, in a hopefully soon upcoming release. We'll be shipping more of the kind of drivers with Liquibase. So you don't need to worry about that additional step. Um, but for now, um, that's that's what we're doing. Uh, the other thing that I've done is I pre-set up a um, cockroach database here. Um, I did not clear it out like I needed to, um, but you can see over here, I have a, I have a cockroach database here going. Um, um, and so, you know, kind of what, what we start out with is um, I just kind of have a, a blank um, config or a, a blank migration script here. Um, I'm going to start with this um, uh, called Liquibase formatted SQL is, is the changelog format um, that we're going here. Um, terminology wise, um, these kind of files that contain all of your changes, we call it as a change log. Um, and then the, this change log is, is broken up into a series of change sets uh, where each change set is the particular step um, that you want to make along the way um, to getting your, your database to where you want it to be. Um, so what I can do is I can define a change set. Um, I define it this way. Um, uh, there we go. Um, so first, just kind of stopping at this point right here. Um, the, the way that this uh, formatted um, SQL is kind of set up is it's trying to um, follow standard um, SQL syntax. And so our kind of metadata that we kind of put into the SQL file um, is in, in a uh, SQL comment so that, you know, it's, it's not getting in the way of syntax highlighting and all that sort of thing. Um, and within each, each change that gets um, identified by um, two pieces of information here, actually a third, but I'll show that in a, in a second here. Um, there's an ID and an author. Um, the reason we, we track this ID and author and, and list them in here is because Liquibase isn't trying to have a specific version to your database. Just not saying like, I'm going from version, you know, one to two to three to four. Um, instead, what Liquibase is doing is it's tracking which of the, it, it tracks the chain sets atomically and independently. And so it can look at, you know, of all the chain sets that haven't been ran, which ones have not been ran so I can execute that. And so we need a way to be able to identify these chain sets. Um, and, you know, we need, and I wanted a way for, you know, as, as somebody's authoring this, this chain set to, you know, really be able to have kind of a way of easily creating these identifiers. You know, we don't, as you're editing a file, we don't have, you know, an automatic auto increment or that sort of thing. And um, you want a way that, you know, isn't going to conflict with IDs if, if two separate uh, developers are both, you know, editing the same file at the same time. You know, we want to be very version control friendly. And so having an ID and an author is really kind of a way of making a manual, globally unique identifier, you know, where the author is you. So that means that, you know, nobody else is going to be, you know, using this. So, you know, really kind of a namespacing thing. Um, so that then all I have to worry about is my ID is unique among ones that I'm putting in. And then I can just kind of do whatever I want. Like I can call it just kind of one like I do. It's just a string. So I could call it, you know, create person table or, you know, any any sort of identifier that you want. It's really just kind of a string um, to kind of track what's going on. Um, and then I can just put my SQL in here. ID int primary key name bar care 20. Maybe we'll do 50. People can have long, long names. Um, so I have my table here and then what I can do is I can just run, um, from this directory, which is my you know, project director here. Um, I can run Liquibase update is the, is the command to run. Um, there's a variety of flags that you can pass along to it. Um, you know, in, in this case, the ones that I need, um, is I put in the change log file, uh, which is change log SQL. Um, I need to put in my URL, um, you know, since it's a database or since it's a job application, um, you need to kind of look up how your JDBC um, syntax looks like. Um, I need my username and because I'm just using the, the insecure Docker setup, I don't need passwords or anything like that. Um, I just can run Liquibase update here. It will go along and it says update was executed successfully. And so now if I go and I look in my database here, I can see there's now a person table um, that has a, you know, it has my ID and name column in there. 
Um, the other thing that you'll notice here is it create Liquibase will create two separate tables as well uh, that we use for tracking. Um, the primary one is this database change log table. Um, and the job of that table is to track which of those changes that have been executed. Um, so you can see it has the ID, um, it has the author. Oh, it looks like I put the, um, uh, it's been too long since I was typing that in. I did it wrong there, sorry about that. Um, the format is supposed to be, I forget that it was uh, trying to be shorter. So it's like this format here. Um, so you can see, um, yeah, so see, it's, it's tracking the ID I put in. It's, it's tracking the author. No, it did put the ID. i have to check that again in a minute. Um, and then it also has the file name. Um, we, that file name was that third piece, the identifier that we use. Um, and so that way, you know, again, kind of from that, make it easy, globally unique identifier. Um, if you create a second change log file, um, you only have to worry about that ID that you're kind of manually managing in that one file of things that you did. Um, and then it, tr it tracks some, some other metadata in there, like, you know, when it was executed, the um, check some of it, you know, did it pass, you know, what version of Liquibase, um, some of that sort of stuff. Uh, but you can see, you know, you know, the, the table ended up being put there. Um, the other thing to point out real quick before I kind of go on to the other examples is it does get to be a pain having to put in your arguments all of the time. Um, and so we do have a Liquibase properties file um, that you can set as well that Liquibase will just kind of automatically look for configurations in. Uh, so in this case, I, I put the same um, settings that I had, the change log file, the URL and the username here in this properties file um, so that I can just run Liquibase update um, again here. And it, it's pulling that information from there. Um, oh, that's the problem with the, the live demos. It always <laughs> ends up showing more things than you were necessarily planning to. I'll go back that's to that. That's a good thing. Now. That's all right. I have a um, question, but, Nathan. When, really quick, when, when you get feedback from developers about Liquibase, what is the thing that they appreciate the most about the tool? Um, I think, you know, what, what they what they appreciate most is, you know, kind of a combination of the ability to just be able to kind of specify exactly what is going to happen, be able and, and be able to kind of um, kind of control and manage what what is going to be happening in the update process here. Um, and then also the sort of flexibility and power that, that Liquibase has to it. Um, there's a lot of features, a lot of functionality because, you know, a lot of times that sort of first 80 percent of I need to I need to make my make, keep my database up to date is kind of easy to do and easy to get to. But there's those you know edge cases and those problems and oh you know I, I get into this case or this happened and you know how do I handle that? Um, and Liquibase has a lot of power and a lot of um, functionality and features so that you know kind of regardless of the um, regardless of kind of the edge cases that you get into, um, Liquibase is able to handle it. That's great. Um, I'll finish this one here fast. Um, you can you can see it, it it runs the update. You know I can just run update again, and Liquibase knows because of that change log file that my um, you know that this particular change set is already ran. So you know that's you know in the end what Liquibase is doing is it's it's comparing you know what's what's in this definition to what has already been ran, and it knows okay I don't have to run this again. Um, and so it's not going to. So it's it's kind of performing that work for you. Um, and then if I go to another database, it will um, kind of bring all of that along. And then as you need to make changes, um, I can do a new one. I'll follow my still wrong pattern here because I know that's working anyway. <laughs> um, I can do alter table person add um, column last name. Like I, I, I realize I, I have an extra column that I, I need to run. Um, what you can do is you can run the, you know, add, add that extra column, you know, run your update. Liquibase is going to go and apply it for you um, so, that, so that now you have this one. Um, you know, but the thing, to, the thing to really notice there is that, um, you know, you're not going back and changing the previous change sets. You know, the, it's not trying to define this is what I want my database to look like and leaving Liquibase to figure it out because in the end, any tool that kind of tries to do that is going to get that wrong sometime, sometimes. Um, instead, it's letting you kind of define that 
that evolutionary um, um, process that you're wanting to kind of follow through and, you know, kind of leaving it up to you to, um, you know, kind of know and understand and apply those sort of evolutionary database best practices that really kind of apply to, to your particular situation. Nice. What what's what is the use case of Liquibase that surprises you the most? Um, the um, probably there's there's definitely you know you're we talking earlier today uh, with some other people about uh, kind of trying to use it for test data management or just kind of data management in general. Um, well, I you know kind of had some initial thoughts of you know how do you manage you know it, it, oftentimes. Um, data is as important to um, control in your um, data deployments as um, you know your your schema structure is. Um, you know people have looked to use it for more you know kind of almost backup and restore um, capabilities of you know kind of snapshotting capabilities. And while it's it's not um, you know it, it, that's not its primary goal, it's worked surprisingly well for that. You know especially as kind of a cross database backup and restore tool. Cool. Um, Andrew, when, when no, you're sorry. evaluating uh, the way that people use Liquibase, you know, users of CockroachDB and Liquibase, what are some, you know, things that come up in, in those conversations that you have with users? Uh, well, for one, I believe Liquibase now has kind of first party support. So Cockroach, unfortunately, doesn't have perfect compatibility with Postgres. Um, and this is something people run into. Uh, and so one thing is making sure that people separate out their changes in a way that Cockroach is happy with. In particular, the transactional semantics of schema changes is an active project that my team has been working on and is continuing to work on. Uh, Postgres has this amazing property of, of being like fully transactional with its, with its uh, schema changes. But the downside of that is it doesn't have online schema changes, or it has a few of them. But for the most part, they lock tables. And so that's sort of the tension here. And Cockroach, from the very beginning, implemented this online schema change protocol that's very cool. You can have long running, hour long schema changes to move terabytes of data, and we won't lock for writes. But with it comes kind of worse transactional semantics, at least in the current implementation. And so one thing that's important is for safety reasons, you should separate your drops of, in particular, tables and columns from additions. That's a, a really big piece of advice I, I give people. And in practice, shorten your transactions to be kind of one table each in these migrations. Yep, and and probably related that, to that too, just a general liquid base best practice is, you know, the, the chain, each chain set we try to run in a transaction. Um, and so that if anything fails, we, we roll it back um, and we only mark it as complete when it's done. Um, but if you have anything that's doing kind of any auto committing of transactions in the middle, um, you, you don't want to do more than one in there or you're going to potentially, excuse me, uh, run into some problems. You know, like if you did a you know, like you try to create both person and address in the same change set, you know, if the if the person succeeds, but the address fails, um, it can't roll. Most databases can't roll those back. Postgres is a bit of a outlier in that, like you said, um, um, but just kind of keeping it to a single statement with a change set's usually a, a safe best practice. Nathan, what are the most popular use cases for Liquibase? Um, most popular use cases, I and mean, so from the developer standpoint, um, it's you know the the um, just kind of trying to integrate it into your um, sort of inner loop, your developer inner loop of kind of your you know sort of develop test um, you know, sort of check process that you're kind of continually going over. Where you know as as a developer, I'm going along, I realize you know oh I need you know I need this extra column on this table in order to make my code work. Um, so you add that. Um, you know, add that extra change set in there to that file directly. You, you run your liquid base update to make sure that, you know, it is semant syntactically correct. And then you run your code to make sure that, you know, it's semantically correct. It's working, you know, your, your application's working the way that it's supposed to. Um, and then you can commit your application 
um, you know, your application changes and your change log file, you know, oftentimes in the exact same repository in the same branch, and they just kind of go out and, and continue on that way. Um, so, you know, from the, the, the developer workflow standpoint, um, that's, that's, that's very common. Um, the other piece uh, that, that's very common as well is sort of the collaboration between the, uh, the different, um, you know, people that are interested in kind of what's going on with your database. Um, you know, for example, we have a, um, let's see, we'll just go this way. It's going to work. Oops. Yeah. Um, you know, if I, if I go back to, you know, in this case, an empty database here, um, uh, you, besides just running an update statement, you can also do, for example, update SQL, uh, which is going to output, you know, this is, this is the SQL that would be executed against this database. Um, and you're able to give that to your DBAs or other people uh, to be able to see, okay, these are the changes we're looking at uh, coming out um, with this release. Um, you know, you also have things like there's a, um, you know, future rollback, or not future rollback, um, yeah, future rollback SQL, um, you know, command, which will output, you know, this is, if, if this release goes poorly, this is the SQL that it would take to get back to the current spot that we're at. Um, that again, like DBAs and other people could look at um, to make sure, you know, we're not, you know, that, that wouldn't be losing data, making sure that, you know, you have, have your plan in place for, um, you know, something going wrong. So it's not even more of a disaster if something goes wrong. Uh, so we have some of that kind of collaboration tools in there. Um, besides just the CLI we're showing here as well, we also have um, Liquibase Hub, uh, which really kind of works like um, GitHub around Git, where, you know, the, the job of Liquibase Hub is to kind of help with more of that collaboration and reporting and communication where you're able to kind of, you know, have for, for people that are looking for more of that, that larger view across your pipeline, across all of your databases, you know, what's going on, you're able to kind of see that from a, a web interface. Oh, that's great. There, I do want developers who watch this stream to, to walk away feeling like they can be successful with Liquibase. And in, in that spirit, are there a few common mistakes that, that you'd like to try and coach people around? Uh, yeah. Um, so a couple things that I'd, I'd maybe mention, um, you know, first would be not sort of optimizing it for, for your, your, your particular usage. You know, my example here, I'm using a, uh, um, you know, using the CLI, but we have integrations to popular build tools like, you know, Maven or NPM that can kind of, you know, plug it in plug it into your process a little bit easier. Um, you know, that we also have a, a variety of change log formats too. Um, you know, we're using this sort of formatted SQL. Uh, we also have XML and YAML and JSON formats that, that each have some kind of pros and cons that, you know, are going to work better for some teams or the other. And oftentimes, you know, I, I find people that just sort of see one format of an example and it doesn't really work for well, well for them like you know maybe they don't understand SQL very well and you know forcing them to use SQL is you know is 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 difficult for them or maybe you know they they do know SQL and you know the uh, kind of automatic stuff that the the XML and YAML and JSON formats do is just kind of getting in the way you know so so you know understand the different formats and kind of what makes sense for you and and what doesn't um, uh, let's see, I mentioned the, uh, you know, kind of keep your change sets or changes, keep your change sets able to run as a single transaction. Um, and, and the other thing that I'll mention too is, um, you know, kind of once you have, when, once you've sort of committed and pushed a particular change set, um, if you know, you know, it's, it, and um, yeah, when, once you've kind of committed and pushed um, this change set, it's, you know, out in the world, it's kind of not in your control anymore. If you realize that, oh, you know, like it shouldn't be last, you know, like maybe I misspelled it here um, when I originally did it, instead of going back there and changing it, because now you've had some databases that have deployed the one version and now now you have some others that do it. Um, you know, you need to you need to follow or it's, it's best to follow a roll forward approach where you just make another change set um, uh, for you know, to, to rename the column um, so that, you know, it's, it's just kind of a, a, a rolling forward thing um, versus kind of going back and, and fixing it. You can certainly fix it until you commit it, but once you commit it, it it's out in the world. And, and you know, while there's ways to go and fix it um, when you need to, um, it's, it's usually best to try to avoid that and just roll forward. That's good feedback. Is there, um, 
you know, I've, I've taken a look at Flyway as well. And I'm curious, like, how do you compare? What, what are some of the sort of differences? Um, you know, so at, at the sort of central spot, we do very similar things where we are just kind of, you know, taking the, the, the your sort of change log script and executing against the database. Um, there's certainly some differences in, um, you know, the, the, the format of the files. Um, you know, Liquibase, for example, um, you know, we, we, by default, are kind of going more for a, let's just kind of keep appending to the same file, whereas Flyway is more like, you know, you're creating separate files all of the time. Um, you know, Liquibase does have an include feature that lets you, or an include all, that lets you, you know, kind of break stuff up into, you know, a single change set per file if you really kind of prefer that mechanism. But, you know, that's, that's really just sort of, I don't know, it's, it's kind of neither here nor there. It's, it's kind of a, uh, um, um, just kind of a, a sort of minor structural difference thing. Um, probably some of the, the biggest change, or probably the, the biggest differences kind of come in um, some of the more advanced understanding that, that Liquibase can have and, and, and provide for you, um, especially in the XML formats. Um, you know, when you're, when you're running uh, with the, the SQL format here, um, like say we we're just kind of specifying the, the actual SQL that you have um, with, um, with XML, what you do is you have a, um, you know, kind of more of a, a sort of a descriptive structure like this, um, you know, where we're saying, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of defining it this way and you really want to kind of think of it as sort of a function, like it's like you're calling a function where you're, you're um, calling the create table function, you know, these are the arguments to it. And then you're leaving Liquibase up to figure out the correct SQL to run. Um, and, you know, that that sort of little bit of a separation between you describing what you want and um, and Liquibase kind of generating that SQL, um, you know, can give you a lot of advantages around being able to support multiple different databases, you know. So, for example, maybe you use CockroachDB for your, um, you know, as your real database, but you want to be able to run unit tests against SQLite or something like that. Um, you're able to use that same change log against both those databases, and it's going to generate the correct SQL for both. Um, whereas, you know, hard-coded SQL is not going to be able to do that. Um, Liqu you know, Liquibase, because it also has this kind of understanding of how you get kind of from one state to the next, um, we have some tools like a uh, generate um, change log, um, which will actually, will, yeah, uh, let's see, yeah, let's start with that one. Um, change log file equals, oh, not XML. Um, and what it'll do is it will, um, you know, kind of inspect your database, look at it and generate, you know, these are, I cleared out my database, so there's nothing there. Um, but it will, you know, kind of output, you know, these are the change sets that it takes to get to, from your, you know, empty database to your current spot. Or you can also do that like between two databases to pick up sort of differences between them. Um, you can also, you know, it has some ability to do kind of some comparisons between databases of, you know, these are missing, um, not, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, we also have a lot of support for things like um, preconditions and, um, you know, that let you let you do kind of more, um, you know, sort of if logic in these particular change sets. And it's it's a lot of things where kind of like, like I mentioned earlier, where, you know, it's easy to kind of hit that 80% of like, you know, it's, I, I'm, I'm making sure these changes get applied. Um, but then Liquibase has a lot more capabilities as you kind of get beyond that and you realize, oh, I, I need to handle this case. How do I do that? I need to handle this case. How can I do that? And, and Liquibase has, you know, I think a lot more um, functionality and options as you start kind of getting to that second level. One of the first questions I had when you introduced the ID author order or lack of ordering on some level is how do you enforce preconditions or dependencies and is is this precondition mechanism the way you state also dependencies um no it's not um no it's not necessarily for dependencies um you know really as far as dependencies and ordering um we really just kind of rely on order in the file um and and just kind of leave it up to the author to know that okay the the you know the first step that i do here i'll go back to this one you know the first step that I do here is I, you know, create the table and then I add a column and then I add another column and then I add another column. And, you know, the fact that it's, you know, it, it's, it, and as you come up with more changes, you're just kind of appending onto the, 
the end of that file. Or like I say, if you use the include, you can kind of break them up to get them too large to keep them from getting too large. But you're you're just sort of writing a script of the things that you have to do. Liquibase doesn't have to know and care about um, about the the order and, and figure out the order. It just you know does the order that that you tell it to do. And if you realize you know oh this you know this one should have happened after this one over here, you can just kind of move them around. And you know now they're in a different order, um, and they'll they'll be ran differently. Um, so it's it yeah orders purely based on that. Um, preconditions get used more for um, it, it, the main use cases when you start having kind of some database drift between your different databases. Like maybe um, you know you have you know on your production database there was some big um, emergency and they had to go and create some, um, some extra indexes to handle, you know, something going on and they just made them live to the production database because they had to. Um, and then, you know, you need to make sure you want to make sure that that gets then encapsulated into your change log for everywhere else. And so you create your change log of, you know, create index, um, you know, kind of describing what you, what you do, you know, normally Liquibase isn't trying to figure out, you know, does this index exist? It just is looking at that, database change log table. Um, and so then you, you do a index exists precondition, um, you know, saying, you know, kind of listing the table here, you know, put the index name in, and then you'd say when it fails, mark it as ran. Um, so that way, you know, it, it, it will create the index everywhere that that index doesn't exist. And so, you know, when you when it hit production, it's not going to create that index, um, but everywhere else it will just kind of help get that sort of database drift under control. Um, that's that's usually the the primary use of those preconditions. Very cool. It kind of leads us to the question that was posted in the chat, um, which is about yeah, here what's what's the best way to deal with a change log that's grown to a huge size over years? Um, the, my answer to that is usually that's okay. Um, you know the the um. Um, you know, it's the, the, as, as the change log gets, it gets large, I guess, first, you know, you, you can certainly use include to start breaking them up. So the files that you have to care about, um, end up being small. So usually like, you know, I'll have a, uh, root change log that just doesn't include for maybe each kind of major version that I had, you know, so it does, you know, first it includes the change sets for version one and then version two and then version three. So each of those kind of major versions at least are in a, a change log file and then, you know, each time I come up with a new version, you know, I'm starting fresh in that file that I'm looking at. So, you know, the file that I'm using doesn't get to be, you know, 100,000 lines long or something like that. It's, it's a little bit more manageable that way. Um, but then even as they get larger, um, you know, the, you're usually just kind of appending on to the end of the file. Um, you know, so if I, if I open up my file, I hit control end and I put something at the bottom, it kind of doesn't bother me that there's stuff higher up in there. Um, and, and the, you know, and, but, and then the reason that I like to keep them, um, keep them around and, and tend to not change them is because th that is the, um, that is the path that I know works that has built up over the years that has been kind of, you know, the pieces of it have been applied to all my different databases. So it's, you know, knowing that anytime you change something in software, you're just kind of asking for something to break. It always kind of worries me to touch something that's, that I know is working. And so, you know, that, that's where, you know, my, my first reaction is just to kind of leave it as it is and it's fine. You know, Liquibase is fast about checking the, the RAN change sets. Um, and it's, you know, anything that's already ran, it just, you know, skips over them and continues on. Um, there's, you know, there's certainly, um, 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 you know, exceptions to that rule, you know, the, the, and um, because while some data, some, most, you know, databases are usually fast about changes that you're putting in, you know, creating a table is easy, you know, adding a column is usually easy, depends on the database and the size, size of the table. But, you know, it's there, each operation is usually fast. There's some that are slow, like, you know, creating an index on a large table. And then later on, you just drop that index again. Um, you know, those I will sometimes go back and you know, when I realize, okay, I need to drop this index, I can just go in and, you know, remove the original create table or create index change set, you know, just delete it. And, you know, from that point forward, Liquibase doesn't, you know, doesn't know and care. New, new databases aren't going to try to create it. And then I do a, a drop index with that, you know, if, if the index exists, drop it sort of trick that we just did um, and just kind of do it for the, the performance hotspots, but otherwise kind of try to leave everything in place. Um, you know, if, 
if you really don't want to do that or you're kind of feeling like you know it's a good time for a reset um that that that's also one spot where the generate change log can be useful that can take a you know pre-existing database um you know create a new change log out of it um that, that that's going to kind of encapsulate everything down and and kind of you know create everything all in one fell swoop um you do want to make sure you go and, and look through that because you know, the, what we generate and generate change log isn't always exactly what you are looking for, um, you know, because, you know, we're, we're trying to work across all databases and databases oftentimes have, um, you know, strange and unique things that each does. And so, you know, some of the complex, you know, index um, creation settings, you know, sometimes we don't pick those up. Um, sometimes they're not even available at runtime. They're only there with the initial creation. So you do need to you know, kind of go through and look at that generated change log, but um, that that's an option as well too. I I think this technology is very cool. I was kind of curious. You, you mentioned that you can generate change logs kind of with changes from some previous change log or something like that. Yeah. Well, what it is is we don't look at the previous change log um, in order to generate them. You know, what it is is. Um, it will, you, you can take, you know, like a previous change log that you had, run it against a database that you have so that that database is sort of fully up to date with that change log. Um, and then you can run the generate change log, will look at the database and generate all the changes you need to do that. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give the example here. So I run my update. Oh, I've been messing with my update. So it's going to be weird and it's going to complain about this one right here. Um, there we go. So it's easy. You know, you have an error in your SQL. It's going to tell you. There we go. So now I did, now I did my um, update. So my database has um, in here. I have a person table, and I have uh, my ID int and last nay column that's spelled wrong. Um, and so now, if I do generate change log pointing it to that out text file, it'll complain because the out text file exists. I run my generate change log. And um, now when I look at that, you can see it, you know, what it did was it looked at the database, it saw that, okay, I have, you know, I have a person table um, that's missing, um, or that, you know, I, I need to create a person table. This is what's in that person table currently. It looks at, yeah, what, what the database looks like. So it's not looking at your old change log file. It's looking at the database and then generating, you know, what what changes you, you need for that. Um, we also have a diff change log. Um, so especially as you're kind of introducing Liquibase into a process, um, you know, maybe you have a bunch of developers or DBAs that are, are really most comfortable with, you know, kind of going into their database and, you know, making changes, um, you know, to, you know, in, in their IDE, you know, they, they create the table in there, they add some columns, they do whatever they need to do. Um, and then we have a, a diff change log that will compare, you know, their development database with some reference database and will append the needed um, change sets on into your file um, so that it'll kind of, again, try to capture those changes that the people made in the tool into your change log. Um, to kind of save you the the typing in your in your change log file that way, um, you do definitely need to look at those change sets that got generated and not just assume they're right. Um, because like I like I mentioned, you're not you know it, it doesn't always capture everything they tried to do. And there's there's also some things that it just can't. Like if you rename a table, like if I if I rename this person to customer, um, that diff operation is going to see oh the person table's gone now there's a, a um, customer table. So I should drop the person table and create the customer table. But, you know, it gets you to the right spot in the end, but you lose data, which you don't want to do. So, you know, you, you want to look at those generated change sets and sometimes have to tweak them. So that's where I, I, I generally try to push people to that, you know, sort of change set first, code first authoring um, cycle. Uh, but we do support other workflows if, if that works best for you. Got it. That's a very cool feature. Hey, Nathan, I could be horribly wrong about this, but it's my understanding that schema migration is not something that's covered extensively like in CS programs and, and young developers are a, a little intimidated by it. And so I'm curious, what are, and maybe you've touched on some of this already in, in the best practices, but what's what's the best way to get started with Liquid Base to just you know get your feet wet and, and learn the ropes, so to speak? 
Um, I, I think the, um, I, I think probably sort of the, the um, demo that I kind of gone through is probably a good, a good first step here. You know, I, I'd say, you know, I, I would probably say start with the, the formatted SQL just because it's, it's maybe a little bit more natural to kind of what people use. Um, just, you know, assuming that they kind of know SQL and understand that. Um, and just, you know, install Liquibase, you know, start adding change sets, um, start kind of playing around with the features, you know, try, try doing your update, you know, go in and make a change to an existing change set and, you know, sort of see what happens. Um, you know, kind of look at, look at the rollback functionality and how that works. Um, so that, you know, uh, just, it's just to kind of show what, what there is you can do, you know, besides that update, you can say like rollback count, you know, one, and it would roll back you know, the sort of last change set that was executed um, and just kind of, you know, look at look at what it's doing to your database, look at, um, you know, just kind of be thinking about, you know, how how you would just kind of fit that into your process that you are already comfortable with. Um, how did these rollbacks work? You're looking for? Sorry, I, I'm kind of jumping in here. These rollbacks, they seem really cool. You've mentioned that there's a tool to generate rollbacks. How does that work? Sure. Um, so the way that it works is um, if you, you know, so so if you're using formatted SQL, and that's kind of one one difference here is um, Liquibase doesn't actually understand the SQL that you're giving it here because again, we're trying to support you know dozens of databases, and they you know SQL is notoriously terrible to try to port, parse and manage. Um, but you're able to say you know you're able to kind of define the rollback. Um, um, SQL yourself in here. So you do like, you know, in this case, I know that I'm adding a column. Um, I do alter table person drop column last name. You know, so I know, you know, in order to roll back this change set two, that's the stuff that I would have to do. Um, you know, this one would be drop table person, you know, is, is the rollback um, to, to specify. So now that I have that, um, I can do, you know, liquid base rollback count one. And it's going to, um, you know, kind of unroll back that one. Oh, I've been changing some stuff around here, haven't I? Uh, that what that error is pointing out is uh, liquid base. It's it's tracks what you have for your change sets in there, um, or the the checksums of the um, change sets because um, you know we want to know if you know you've uh, a previous version of the change log ran against your database. You know, and like it was creating your person with a primary with a, a bar care 50 and somebody goes in and changes it to bar care 100. Um, you know, we want to know that, you know, what's in the change logs different than what you ran. Um, so that that's what that is catching. Um, and I've been messing with my examples here. Um, you know, so now now I can say look, liquid base rollback count one and it's going to, you know, roll back this you know, ID number two, you know, it's because everything's sequential, it just starts at the back, back and just kind of rolls forward that way. Um, so now you can see like, if I do a liquid base um, status, you know, it's gonna say, it's gonna tell me that, um, you know, one, one change that hasn't been applied. Um, if I look at my history, I'll see, you know, only one of them has been applied. Um, so it, it, it kind of rolled that back. I can, I can go all the way back to, um, one more in there, and um, you know that that is one difference with the um, uh, with the the XML or YAML or JSON formats. We're able to do these sort of um, um, uh, these kind of more functional style, descriptive style ones. Um, in this case, you know, I have a I have a change set with create table here. Um, and I don't have to manually put that rollback statement. I don't have to kind of think about what it is because as Liquibase is looking at it, it knows, okay, they're asking to create a table named person. So I know just from looking at this information that the way to roll that back is to drop a table named person. Um, and so we're able to automatically generate that rollback um, logic for you know more of the things in this you know, sort of XML or YAML or JSON format. Um, you can certainly still specify it if you'd like, um, but we're able to kind of more automatically do it for you. It's something you can't like drop, like if you have a drop table, you know, we don't know from that drop table parameters how to recreate that table. Um, and so you need, you know, some of them you need to do that rollback, but 
probably three quarters of them. Um, and a lot of the ones you usually do um, can be uh, um, handled, you know, kind of more automatically. Very cool. Nice to see. Nathan, I feel like we could go on asking you questions all day. And um, this is so fun to just have hands on the keyboard and, and to watch you work and watch you use the tool. We're in the interest of time, we do need to wrap up. Yep. Where should people go? Where should they go to get started? Uh, you can go to liquobase.com is our, um, is our uh, kind of site where you can get started and download stuff. Uh, we also have our Liquobase GitHub um, project if you want to kind of look at the code and see what's there. Um, I, you can uh, contact me. Um, I'm, my email address is just Nathan at liquobase.org um, or I'm at Twitter at, at nvoxland, N-V-O-X-L-E-N-D, um, with any questions you got on there too. Um, or if you don't want to contact me directly, um, there's an answers at liquobase.org email address as well that um, anyone on the, the team can can answer and um, help you out. Okay, also, great. Also forum.liquobase.org is another great uh, resource for asking asking questions and just kind of interacting uh, with us in general. Okay, we will uh, we'll add links to all those in the uh, video description. Um, we do, Nathan, we try and approach these shows without bias, but uh, we are big fans of Liquidbase and we know it well. And um, we really hope that the developers that are watching the stream will go and, and play with the tool and learn about it and start to use it. Um, after meeting with you, Nathan, and, and spending some time with you, now we like it even more. Uh, it's been such yeah. a pleasure to, to get to know you a little bit and get to know the tool a little bit better. Um, looking forward to chatting again in the future. Let's let's keep an eye on you know where Liquid Base is headed, and let's talk again. Um, you know when CockroachDB is a little further along, and and we're we're playing nicely together. That'd be great. Always, I got I got way more stuff I could show. Okay, okay good. Okay, good. <laughs> well, we'll save it for the next one. It's Thank you everybody you. for watching. I, uh, you know, catch us again on the next stream. We'll, we'll dial up another tool and we'll talk about something else useful for uh, developers out there. All right. Bye-bye.